This podcast of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs is sponsored by AAA Heating and Air. The premier HVAC company in the Midlands is growing. Are you a top HVAC technician? AAA Heating and Air is looking for dedicated applicants to fill their fast-growing service department with top-notch HVAC technicians. If you're the best, then they want you. If you're ready to stop working and start a career, you can earn up to $100,000 plus a year at AAA Heating and Air. Quality candidates will have at least two years' experience and a good driving record. Benefits include top industry salaries, commission on service and unit sales, set call limits, company-provided take-home vehicle and gas card, company-provided cell phone and tablet, health, dental, and vision benefits, 401k retirement plan with company match, and scaled PTO based on length of service. Contact Roy and Dana Finley at 803-677-1500 or check out their job postings on Facebook or ZipRecruiter. Triple A air when you need us. Triple A heating and air. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs, founded by Firemen. With Chris Clark. The 2007 South Carolina class was, at that time, sixth in the country and fourth in the SEC, which is amazing. Wes Mitchell. You know, I think for South Carolina, you're you're aiming to, to at least be at 50%. Then, in theory, you're adding talent, you're getting better, you're putting yourself in a position to compete. And Tyler Head. It's been a great week for South Carolina. On the recruiting front, still certainly plenty to talk about. On the home of the Gamecocks. 107.5. The Game. And welcome into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs here on 107.5 The Game. Tyler Head and Wes Mitchell along with you today. Chris Clark taking today off. I uh, believe he'll be back in here Tomorrow, no? Okay, so taking the two days off. Chris is in Dallas, actually. Oh, you know what? I think I remember him saying that. Final that four. Sense. Final four, yes. Yes. Uh, very we, may, we may get him to call in okay. tomorrow. Yeah, I might get him to check in. That's uh, certainly going to be a, a fun weekend. We'll certainly dive into a little bit of the Final Four matchup a little bit later on in the show. But thanks again to Perry Orth for hanging out with us for the uh, Garnet Trust Hour. Gave us a lot of great insight, you know, and um, I've been on here when he's uh, called in for, like, Bill's show in the morning on the early game. He's very, very passionate about NIL and everything going on with that, so certainly a lot of great insight from him there. And, of course, I had to get a Spurrier story out of him before he left. Yeah, that was fun, man. Hopefully the listeners enjoyed it as well. Um, I don't want to, you know, kiss Perry's tail too much uh, because he's a buddy of mine, but um, I think we could have just talked some ball for, like, three hours, man. So that was... That was awesome to catch up with him. He's got great stories. And, I mean, huge, just bright future, yeah. I feel like, as a coach. I mean, watching him watching him grow as a coach has been awesome. Uh, the QB1 camps, if you have a, a young you know, football player in the area, go check those out. Uh, follow Perry on Twitter. Um, I think it's at PerryOrth10. I'll, I'll uh, double-check yeah, that. That's um, correct. That is right. Yeah, yeah. go follow him on there. Um, he does a great job with the sort of on the field, like the mechanics of playing quarterback, but really something they add a, a lot of is like the film room part of it and, and kind of learning that side. And I'm, I'm sure yeah. has done a fantastic – he did a great job at AC4 and is doing a great job at Cardinal Newman as well. But, um, you know, I thought it was interesting hearing him talk about the different offenses he's played in and the offense at Carolina so far. And then even just how he's been taken care of by this Gamecock community. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, and he's still very well ingrained in it. And uh, like you mentioned, it's so cool for uh, you know the kids that he coaches and teaches <clears throat> to see him still involved with the South Carolina football program to some degree, going out there and throwing at pro day. And you mentioned him, uh, you know, working with Josh Van and everything. So still a very, very important part of this community. And uh, you know, is getting his coaching career rolling, and there's no telling where that's going to take him. Hey, he was spinning that thing, man. Like I. Uh I didn't realize he was going to throw to Josh, and then you know I saw him out there from a distance, and but he he's thrown several pro days if I remember correctly, yeah, and kind of has it down to a science uh, I think as far as putting the ball where it needs to be and knowing the different routes and route trees that you want for guys to be able to show. As he said, he did get the he put Darius Rush in a position to make that beautiful one handed grab as well, right? Um, but but yeah, I mean great representative of what South Carolina I think is all about and and it just goes to show you never know where life is going to take you and you know it's kind of it's almost become a cliche that whole thing about it's not a it's not a four-year decision it's a 40-year decision but I mean he he is the living breathing walking example of there's a guy from outside of Jacksonville nice area yeah came to South Carolina 
as a preferred walk-on. You know, wasn't the guy that they were like heavily, heavily recruiting to come here. Comes in, works his tail off, finds his way onto the field, and carves out a nice career. And now is carving out a nice um, post athletics or post university career. And uh, really cool to see. Really fun to see. And uh, I mean, I'd encourage everybody to go check out the Cardinal Newman football team this coming fall because, the, as we talked about, man, there's a bunch of Gamecocks on that staff. Corey Helms. Ran into him the other day. Seems to be doing a great job there. And, um, you know, like he said, Quan Lewis is going to be there too. A name some Gamecock fans may remember. And uh, always cool to see the guys that played at Carolina excelling here in the community. Absolutely. Speaking of football, before you came in this morning, you were out at spring practice, practice number eight of the spring session this year. Uh, of course, we were just uh, a little over two weeks away from the spring game coming up on April the 15th, what were you able to see when you were out there this morning? Oh, man. Well, let me just first tell the people, remember our very first Garnet Trust Hour ever, Nate Atkins got caught by the train. Yep. And I warned you and Kendall. Right. I said, look, I'm coming straight from practice. And I waited to the last possible minute. And I had Kendall as my backup option to she start ready the to show. Go. She was ready to roll. She was sitting right here. But... um just in case I got caught by a train. Sure. I didn't even have time to tell y'all. I 100% got caught by a train on the way in typical Columbia fashion. Yep. And traffic right now, I think because 77 is closed off. Correct. It has permeated <laughs> the rest <laughs> of the city. It's taken me almost an hour to get in here the past two days. So I'm, I'm well aware of the bad traffic. Yeah. So typical Columbia, I did get caught by a train. But as a Columbia veteran... It was one of the trains that there are alternate alternate routes. So okay. I made it in here just in time. Lit- literally right behind Perry because I, I didn't know there was nobody out in the bullpen. And like as soon as we ended uh, in the bonus, I look and he's waiting at the door. I'm like, oh, no, let me go let him in. And no sooner did I let him in, you were coming in right behind him. Coming in hot, but we made it. So I, I say all that to say I did have to leave the open practice early even to get here almost late. And so I, I didn't, you know, I'll be honest, I didn't see a ton. They were actually indoors today, so it might have been a little bit lighter workout. Um, I throw a little tidbit at y'all, maybe that speaks to uh, Pete Limbo, and who I think is definitely one of, maybe the best special teams coach in America. And the reason why, Tyler, is the attention to detail and the fact that he thinks of everything. Right. So I look out there today. It was very special teams heavy. They actually had the um, like the jugs machine, the ball machine, shooting out kickoffs. So that way your kicker doesn't have to go out there and just kick over and over and over and over. Yeah. So they're doing kickoffs on one part of the field. They're doing, you know, quarterbacks and centers are just working on snaps at one side. They're doing punt pressure on another sort of quarter of the field at the indoor. Then I look in the middle of the field. And they literally have their big men. So I think I saw Nick Barrett out there. Um, They have their big men having to field squib kicks Mm -hmm. in practice today. And if you think about it, how often if an opponent either squibs or does that pop-up sort of pooch kickoff, how often does one of these big up men who never – in any other circumstance, never yep. has to field the ball, certainly never has to catch a ball that's shot up into the air. Yep. And it looks very awkward a lot of times. And it can lead to turnovers. Well, may, maybe every team does this. I don't know. I don't get to go to other teams' practices. But it just caught my attention sure. that one of your main defensive tackles is out there having to field pop-up squib kicks down, yep. the, uh, down the field. And I, I think just speaks to, hey – they're going to practice everything, yeah. especially on special teams. There's going to be an attention to detail in any possible scenario that you could think of. And I know uh, Beamer talked about it, I think it was last week, the week before, for one of his availabilities when someone asked him how important it was to have a designated special teams coordinator where a lot of teams, you know, every team has one, but a lot of them end up being like, oh, this guy's like the defensive backs coach and also does special teams where it's not his primary responsibility to focus on that. You have Pete Limbo, whose sole responsibility is focusing on what's going on with special teams where they 
think of doing something like that that another team may not think of. And that situation may only come up one time the entire year. But if it goes the way for South Carolina, then it was effective. And, you know, Chris Clark talks about margin for error all the time. If your margin for error is thin and you're playing a team that you're kind of similar talent-wise to, it quite literally could be the difference in, let's say, alternate reality. In one reality, your guy, oh, we do this in practice. He fields it. Yep. He lays on the ground. You retain possession of the ball. In the other reality, you haven't practiced it. He's not used to sort of trying to judge how the ball is going to pop up. It goes off his hands. Other team gets the ball, scores a touchdown on that drive. It, that literally can be the difference between winning and losing. And sure. when, um, when you're talking about in the SEC, a lot of times it does come down to a hand, you know, a handful, I should say, of plays. So I, I think anytime you can focus on those things, they kind of have it down to a science. I think at South Carolina, uh, it, it's very important. And you know, it was brought to my attention actually by someone last week that this special teams unit, in some ways. They return a lot of guys. You look at like the, the premier spots, if there is such thing on special teams, that we all focus on. Kicker, Mitch Jeter, fantastic last year. Yep. He's back. Kai Kroger, one of the top five, maybe the best punter in the country. He's back. Xavier Leggett, who emerged as your kickoff returner last year. Both he and Juju McDowell, who was the kickoff returner the year before, they're back. So some of these premier spots, you do have everybody back. Well, as far as some of the lesser watched spots, like the gunners, the guys that are running, hustling down there to down punts, you know, we saw Darius Rush play a great role doing that, Jalen Brooks. Um, even some of, like, the up men, the guys that nobody, frankly, focuses on as a fan. Sure. They're replacing a lot of guys in those roles, from what I was told. So this is actually a big spring in terms of bringing along – you're, a lot of times it's a backup safety, backup mm-hmm. tight ends, um, some backup defensive linemen that are going to be heavily involved in special teams. Just teaching them the expectation, which are, are very high, obviously, at, at South Carolina for special teams, and bringing them along might be a storyline that we haven't really talked about or hit on, but will be important nonetheless for their success next year. Now, did you get to see your favorite drill, the depth chart drill, uh, drill today? No depth chart drill today. I actually, when we hit this break, I'm going to see what updates. Uh, so Colin and Mike were still out there when I left. Okay. I told them to note anything big. Um, I, I'm looking forward to see if we got any. It, it is officially the non-depth chart depth chart drill. But um, like, I, like we talked about, I guess that was last week, the week before, they do call out for ones and twos. So. Mm-hmm. Beamer can say there's no depth chart all he wants, but there are some ones there, and there are no, some twos. There's no official depth chart, but you get a pretty good idea. Yeah, there's an unofficial depth chart. And for the most part, it it has been kind of, I don't want to say the same. I'm sure it hasn't been because they, they also rotate guys in. You know, yeah, like, sure. here, here's the thing. We may see, we may go out there and we're seeing such a snippet of practice, right? right. We may see the one rep where they said, hey, Josh, go um, go get some reps with the ones on this because coaches are constantly tinkering. Sure, he may have taken reps with the twos every single other snap, but because we're out there for that rep, you know, we say, "Oh, he's working with the ones now." So that there is some danger from that. Like last week, you know, we talked about we did get the depth chart drill. Trey Knox was not working with the ones. Well. Trey Knox has just been a little banged up. Nothing serious at all. He's still been able to practice, yeah. but they are sort of, it's almost like a pitch count. You're saying, hey, let another guy get some work with the ones. So Josh Simon has actually taken quite a bit of reps with the ones at tight end. I'll say this, a um, couple little tidbits for people. The tight ends so far, I would say as advertised in the case of Trey Knox, and I would say... Even, you know, I think Knox is, is still going to be the one. That's my prediction. But Josh Simon didn't come in from an SEC school like Trey Knox. Didn't come in maybe with quite as much um, attention as Trey Knox. I think he has been better than what the average expectation might have been for him from just, you know, random fan number one in that he's been very good. Mm-hmm. And 
I think fans will be happy to hear these these both these tight ends. They're sort of what you would call like your receiver first tight ends. Like if, you know, we all know you have like you know pass catcher tight ends. You have blocker catch in, uh, tight ends. You have sort of balanced. Both of them skew towards they're going to help in the passing game as receivers. Yeah. But both of them have been willing blockers. And likewise, from what I've heard, Nick Elksness, who is more of your block first tight end, much like we started hearing about Nate Atkins this time last year, um, not this time last year, but early in preseason camp last year, it was, yeah, he's a block first guy, but he can catch the ball when needed. He can be that reliable. How often do you see a tight end on a third and two and you want to mix things up and go play action? He's in the game to present that you're going to run the football and then you try to hit him on an underneath route. It's important to have a guy with soft hands who can make those sort of, you would say, kind of easy catches, but uh, to be to have that skill set, and, and he's done that as well. So tight end room, Tyler, we've talked about it, I think, quite a bit, how much it's been just flipped. But so far, so good, I, I think, in that room as far as those guys being what they thought they were mm-hmm. or in some cases actually maybe being even a little bit better. All right, we'll check with Colin and Mike during the break, see if they have any updates and continue our conversation. On the other side, talk a little bit of baseball too as there has been a change for the starting lineup for the Gamecocks tonight as they take on Mississippi State. We'll talk about that next. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs, 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs. Founded by Firemen with Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head on your home of the Gamecocks. 107.5 The Game. And welcome back into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs, Tyler Head and Wes Mitchell. Along with you today, you know, talking about the traffic around the city uh, from a little bit earlier. You know, when you sit in traffic for an entire hour just trying to get to work, sometimes you need to reward yourself. And I feel like a sub of the day at Firehouse Subs would be a great reward. That is a great idea, Tyler. Luckily, our show comes at the perfect time every day for us to tell everybody about the sub of the day at Firehouse Subs. This Thursday uh, and every Thursday, it is the spicy Cajun chicken I had to think about the fact that it, it is Thursday. It yeah. is the the schedule's a little skewed this week. We got Gamecock baseball tonight. Right. Um opening day for MLB. Women's basketball playing tomorrow. It is a huge weekend. Absolutely. In Gamecock Nation. But to get yourself ready, just reward yourself by hitting the rapid rescue at firehousesubs.com. Again, the spicy Cajun chicken is your Thursday sub of the day. That means a medium sub for just seven ninety nine or if you want to go online and get early access, app or online only, to the Smoke and Triple Stack from March 27th to April 2nd. This will be available in store coming up uh, after that. But it's got brisket, ham, turkey, barbecue sauce, cheese, slaw. I actually tried it for the first time yesterday off the app. Outstanding new addition to the Firehouse Subs lineup. Now, you checked with Colin and Mike during the break. Any new updates from practice to uh, mention? You know, not not a whole lot breaking um, or even that newsworthy. You've kind of gotten to the point, y'all, where you kind of have a feel for what's, uh, you know, what's up and what's down. Uh, there, there have been some guys who have been a little bit banged up in the secondary. Beamer mentioned that, uh, I guess that was two days ago. Mm-hmm. Again, it's all running together. But uh, so, so there were some guys missing, I, I think, I think Keenan Nelson and Marcellus Dow were um, sort of being limited in the part of practice that they saw, but nothing is thought to be serious there for the most part. They did, it sounds like, get some version of a depth chart drill. First team receivers, as expected, and as it's been all of really camp that we saw, sure. were Juice, Leggett, Amarion Brown, Trey Knox back working with the first team at tight end. Uh, Josh Simon and Nick Elksness were both taking some second team reps at tight end. And then um, Omega Blake, Landon Sampson, Peyton Mangrum, and Eddie Lewis were all spotted taking some second team reps. And also, uh, Colin noted that all the quarterbacks just uh, appeared sharp in the little bit of practice they saw. Threw some good balls. I think they were doing some one on ones. And uh, they also did some one on one goal line drills that uh, I guess were, 
trying to read. I don't know if these are more. Yeah, these are just one on one like passes, not not blocking. Yeah. And um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll have some more, I guess, detail on those things on Gamecock Central here, probably an hour or so once I get off the air. And later on today for media availability, we're going to hear from Titans coach Jody Wright and offensive line coach Lonnie Teasley uh, around noon. Anything specific you're hoping to hear from those guys? Well, you know, we talked about tight ends first segment. I think my guess is you will hear some of the same things that, um, you know, that I've heard just around the program, the buzz. You know, I I would imagine you hear some of those same things from Jody Wright. Uh, The tight end group has been good. The, you know, I wrote this uh, last night. The freshmen, you know, Reed McKeska, Connor Cox, you know, I don't think they're going to be forced into much action this year unless they're injuries, but Mm -hmm. those guys have been solid and and done what is asked i think cox has put on some good weight so far so uh, so far so good for those guys i'm trying to think i actually believe this is the first time we've heard from lonnie teasley since he became the official o-line coach yes as far as uh, this spring that's correct yeah I, i think at all so um you know that that'll be interesting to hear a little bit more about his philosophy what he's taken you know from greg atkins what he likes to sort of do as far as putting his own spin on it and i mean by all indications teasley has been outstanding he's been a great recruiter south carolina had another top offensive line recruit on campus for practice today and it's just been one guy after another coming on campus at that spot they've already really started to turn their attention to 2025 getting big time guys in there and he obviously can't talk about that but i I imagine he'll talk quite a bit about what that transition has been like to be in the full-time o-line coach and i'll be curious to see if he talks many specifics it seems like coaches more and more don't like to kind of give away oh this guy is our first teamer right now this guy's our second teamer right now i feel like seven eight nine ten years ago you you actually heard coaches do that a little bit more these days they don't so we'll see if he gives anything away but I, i think like we talked about probably yesterday we have a pretty good feel for it tyler um, at least in terms of how the reps have been split. I'm very curious. I'll be, it'll be interesting to see if he's asked about kind of the backup tackles. I think that's a spot where we don't have a great feel for the progress there yet. Uh, coming up on Saturday is a scrimmage. Now, there's going to be no media availability for that. Funny enough, it is going to be the ladies' clinic that Kendall will be attending, so maybe she can get us some inside information there. But what can be learned through these scrimmages throughout spring practice? Obviously, the biggest one being the spring game coming up in a couple weeks, but but how much can uh, the coaches learn from uh, seeing some live reps uh, in a scrimmage? I mean, it's the closest thing you have to real ball. You know, as we've talked about on the show, you don't get to go scrimmage other people. You don't have preseason ball. You don't have joint practices like they have in the NFL, although I think those things would be great for college football. Sure. You don't you don't have it. So this is the closest sort of way you have to simulate real game action. And I think the biggest thing for this week or for this scrimmage will be that you don't have the coaches necessarily on the field getting you lined up properly, sort of checking in with you. If you're in practice, even if you're doing eleven on eleven, it's really kind of like you kind of have a safety net sure and now you don't have that which i I think is is excellent for the guys because it gives the coaches sort of a check-in of all right how how are we progressing is this young guy is this freshman we might be counting on is he being successful right now because he knows he has his safety net or is he really picking this stuff up as as quick as we think he is and I, i think for the players mistakes are not bad if you make a mistake and you learn from it, if you have a situation you haven't been in and this scrimmage introduces that situation and then you're able to turn around, learn from it, and not make the same mistake next time, that is extremely valuable. So I think this is the first time this spring they'll truly be in that in that spot. And then the additional thing, maybe people don't think about much, you're tackling to the ground. There is fewer and fewer actual physical tackling to the ground in practice so in scrimmages most of the time you're going to say this is full on hit everybody except the quarterback tackle to the ground which means two things it gives you one more evaluation piece for the staff both in terms of is is this safety i'm going to be counting on is he tackling is he a good tackler is he doing things the right way 
hey, for running back evaluation, to carry on Joyner, making that transition. Uh, Mario Anderson coming in from Newberry. Heard good things about both those guys. Are they able to transition that into full-on real football? Mm. And the biggest thing of all, can you stay healthy through your scrimmage? You have to tackle, but you have to take care of your teammates, I think. So that will be huge on Saturday as well. A lot of baseball happening today. Of course, the Gamecocks on the road taking on Mississippi State tonight. It's also the opening day of Major League Baseball. We'll talk about all that next on the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs on 107.5 The Game. It's the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs, founded by Firemen, with Chris Clark, Wes Mitchell, and Tyler Head, on your home of the Gamecocks, 107.5 The Game. <laughs> And welcome back into the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, presented by Firehouse Subs here on 107.5 The Game. Tyler Head and Wes Mitchell along with you. Chris Clark out in Dallas getting ready for the Final Four. Maybe we'll hear from him tomorrow, giving us a little bit more of a preview on tomorrow night's matchup against Iowa. But today is a very busy day in the world of baseball. Uh, Of course, it's MLB opening day. We'll get to that in a moment. But South Carolina Gamecocks also on the road, taking on the Mississippi State Bulldogs out in Stark, Vegas, Series running tonight through Saturday. But for the first time this season, a weekend series will not start with Will Sanders on the mound for the Gamecocks. Eli Jones going to get the start tonight. And, you know, when we think about Will Sanders this season, we, we've been talking about it week in and week out. We haven't seen that quintessential Will Sanders start. And his most recent outing um, against Missouri was by far his worst of the season. Went three in the third inning, gave up two hits and uh, five runs with six walks as well. Um, just something's not right with Will Sanders, and uh, uh, Kingston finally saw it fit to, to make a change, at least for this weekend. Well, I think you have the added sort of aspect here, Tyler, of the fact that it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So you're already you're already kind of struggling if you're Will Sanders, and then <clears throat> you're kind of maybe asking him to move up a day if you were to keep him as the first starter. So I think it made for a very easy opportunity to kind of, you almost even can use that as the reasoning. Sure. Like, hey, which he has, you know, so I think we, we all know maybe there, there's more to it as well, but I I think you could maybe use Sanders out of the pen this week and and keep his arm sort of loose, but, or, or maybe, maybe you see it, it's whatever you think is best for him. Does yeah. he need a week to just completely reset? Does he need a week to just kind of, you know, a lot of times guys when they're not pitching will throw a bullpen. Maybe instead of throwing a bullpen, you throw an inning or two in the actual game itself. Right. And, you know, he didn't pitch a ton in the off season, from what I understand and just has not looked like himself while at the same time, if you're South Carolina, you have the benefit of the fact you've still been winning games. Sure even with him not being dominant. And your other guys have pitched very, very well. So yeah. I think going with Eli Jones, it kept you from having to move someone up. You know, essentially it would have been two days. Yeah. And Mahoney pitched on um, Saturday as as well. So yep. you're, you're kind of – you're keeping Mahoney, who is com- who was coming off of, obviously, Tommy John – on his normal rest yep. this week, and uh, you're only having to move Noah Hall up one day. So it, I think it made sense just to go with a guy. You can have a short lease if you have to on, on this Thursday game, and you're going up against a team that has not been great mm-hmm. in Mississippi State. It just makes a lot of sense, I feel like, from a lot of different angles going into this weekend. But if you'd have told anybody that Carolina would be, was it now, 24-2? and two? Yep. 24 and 2, 6 and 0 in the SEC, going to Mississippi State, and that they would be as bad as they are, have not won an SEC game, and that Carolina would be doing it without Will Sanders being great. Right. You, you maybe wouldn't have believed them. Sure. But to, to me, all this says is two things A, you got to figure out what's up with Will Sanders. Yep. B, what happens if you can get him right for your final stretch? Yeah. Um, if you can do that, I mean, I, I'll i tell you this, Tyler. I'm, I'm bought in on this team. Like, I, 
at the beginning, I was like, eh, they're not playing great competition. You know, what happens when they face SEC arms? And they're still, I firmly believe in baseball, you're going to have moments where you just look unbeatable. Sure. There will be a game, and everybody will freak out. You know, maybe the Charlotte game is, is a quick example of it. But there will be a stretch where people will start to slump. They'll have several games in a row where they don't hit the ball that well. And people will say, here we go. But the key to baseball, you keep sort of keep battling through, come out of the other side. I think we have enough evidence at this point to know that this team is who we think they are. Yeah. Now, now the question is, can you get through this weekend against a team you're now supposed to beat? Sure. Going on the road all the way to Mississippi one day earlier, I know people will be saying, you know, you want to sweep them. I think two out of three this weekend is actually an excellent result, even though Mississippi State has not won games. Yeah. Then you go into next week when we really start to find out, all right, is this South Carolina team a really good team, which I think we already know they hit that standard, or are they an elite, like, Omaha-level type team? Because, obviously, they can't look ahead, but we can look ahead. Huge game coming up against LSU. But for that game to be, that series to be what you want it to be, you got to take care of Mississippi State this weekend. And you could really help yourself out by having a good start to the series tonight, even though you've got a guy who doesn't have a bunch of innings in SEC play as your starter. And first pitch for that game coming up tonight at 7 o'clock here on 107.5. The game first pitch or uh, first pitch at 7 o'clock. Pre-game can be heard starting at 6.45. Uh, and tomorrow's game going to be on WISW as we're going to be carrying the women's Final Four game here on 107.5. The game it's also opening day for Major League Baseball. We're actually just uh, about an hour and a half away from the Braves getting things started as they take on the Nationals on the road to open up the season. I believe they're looking for their first opening day win since I think 2018. Um, was it, I think Mark Kakis walked off against the Phillies that day. I think that was the last time they'd won on opening day. Um, but regardless, that's what the Braves are doing today uh, you have a slate of games all day long only one nationally broadcast game that going to be the defending champion of the world series astros taking on the white Sox tonight at seven o'clock on espn as a fellow braves fan uh how are you feeling heading into the season pretty good odds for the braves to go to the world series uh from vegas insider heard bill talking about that this morning uh well, wh- wh- where, where are you uh, gauging things right now for the braves yeah i'm good man i I, I don't really look at baseball the way I do other sports. Like, you can't really... There's so much luck involved. It's really just hard to predict. But I I think what you really want in baseball is for your team to go into most seasons having a chance. Mm-hmm. And the Braves have done that. Like, they have built this team. They've built this franchise for longevity the way they've built it. You know, they've had some luck along the way, too, I think, in doing that. But... I'm I'm pumped. I'm excited. Couldn't ask for a better way to start it. I, I think if I mean we know how slow they have started in recent years, but sure. you're on the road, but you're playing the worst team in the division. Max Fried has been outstanding during spring training, and not that that ever means anything, but I, I think he'll be sharp. And it, it's a you know Corbin for Washington. Poor guy has been terrible the last couple of years, and yeah. has been even worse against the Braves. I think I read he gives up like seven. I think his ERA is like seven. Yeah, it's pretty high. I guess the Braves or something insane. But great, great chance for them. And I, I'm ready to actually, Tyler, I'm ready to see the young guys. Mm-hmm. Um, you have uh, Schuster and Dodd, who both, because Kyle Wright is on the IL to start the year, both those guys are in the uh, starting rotation to start the year. Yep, We'll get a look at one of them, I believe, in Game 3, and the other in Game 5. That'll be in St. Louis. So I always like to see the new guys. I actually, I'm, I purposely don't watch much spring training yeah. ball. I did watch the Soroka start mm-hmm. just because I was curious. But I kind of, I like to feel like a kid on Christmas when it is opening day. Yeah, so brand, pur- new, brand yeah. new players. Yeah, purposely yep. don't really watch much. I read a little bit of um, David O'Brien in The Athletic. He's mm-hmm. very good at covering the team. Um, but I- I'm excited, man. I am lucky enough 
to work in sports and to work from home most days to where I'll be able to tune in this afternoon. Yeah, I'm going to be here doing Jay and Terry's show. I know Jay will have it in there on the TV screen that he can see, but uh, I guess I'll have to get a stream going on my laptop in here. Hopefully you can get Bally. I mean, it's you got to have... My network, my TV provider does have Bally on it. So and I know they've recently expanded out to a few more. I know for a couple of years there I wasn't able to get it just because of the provider I had back in Georgia, which is ridiculous, and that's a whole other conversation yeah. for a whole other day is... You know, baseball wants people to watch it, but they don't make it available for people to watch it, and that's kind of a double-edged sword there. Well, even, I mean, I'm looking at the times right now. Not that anybody tunes into this radio station to hear us complain about things, but um, Braves at 105, these other games, 1 o'clock, 210, 220, 310, 405, 410, 410. I could go on and on. Yeah. All the games are while people are at work. Yeah, and I don't know why, and again, most of those are on regional channels outside of the uh, Houston-Chicago game tonight. I don't know why ESPN doesn't have a one game, a four game, a seven game, and a ten game. Like, it's opening day. Go wall to wall with it. It makes too much sense. I don't, I, I don't have answers, but if they want to grow the game, you would think there would be ways to get more eyeballs on it. What, um... What do we all think about the new rules? You know, and like you, I didn't get to watch too much of I didn't watch too much of spring training outside of that crazy ending to that first game they had against the Red Sox where the pitch clock ended up ending the game. So, you know, just kind of reading everything, apparently the pitch clock has trimmed the game down, you know, 20 or 30 minutes like uh like Average they were hoping for. Minutes, I think. Average 26 minutes. I know Jay brought up the stat yesterday, the uh, you know, new shift rules have increased the batting average for left-handed batters, so it's increasing the offense. Um, you know that, which is what they were uh, hoping to do there. I don't know; I can't think of any specifics of, of as far as the larger bases go. But as I was talking to Kendall about earlier, I think it's something we're all going to get used to. You know, pretty quickly. It's something outside of seeing the pitch clock on the backstop like you had against um, uh, uh, the Citadel the other night. I really don't think you're going to think about it too much until somebody starts violating it. Yeah, it's not going to become a thing, except for the few times that it will become a thing. And I right. don't you have to think, are, are they going to be able to show some level of judgment in terms of, like, do you think this is one of those things where, obviously in spring training, they were hyper aware of it, and they called it, like, down to the T. Sure. Do you think early on they're going to be super aggressive about calling it to make people... Yeah, be aware of it or you know I would think maybe early on they are like that but as the season progress like if you're in the playoffs right surely you're gonna have some wherewithal if you're an umpire not to be ridiculous yeah about I, it. I think about it how whenever the NFL introduces a new rule and they go super hard in the yeah. preseason those first couple weeks of the regular season they enforce it hard but they start to relax it as the season goes along. I think it's probably going to be something pretty similar. Well, it's just like when they uh, did the whole sticky substance actual ban. Yeah. Even though it's already, it was banned, but they didn't really enforce it. Sure. They start enforcing it, and everybody, you know, you got pitchers. Was it Scherzer that was, like, about to fight the umpire because he wanted to test his fingers or something? Uh, somebody uh, about undressed for the umpire. Yeah, and, you know, and everybody's making a huge deal about it. Right. And then... After they got used to it, the guys just walk off. They hold their hand out. The umpire daps them up, and they right. keep walking, and there's nothing. It's not even a thing anymore. I think with any transition, anytime something is new, we all pitch a fit. Right. For the most part, I don't, you know, I think it'll play a role, but for the most part, hopefully it is out of, out of sight, out of mind most of the time. Right. I'm well, certainly excited to see uh, opening day for baseball. And on the other side, as we wrap up today's edition of the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, Presented by Firehouse Subs. I want Wes's input on a dilemma I was helping Kendall with this morning. Let's talk about it next on 107.5 The Game. And welcome back in to the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs. Tyler and Wes along with you for a few more minutes before we get into Kendall's dilemma. We've got to tell them about our friends over at Integrated Media. Yeah, if you want to watch those baseball games this weekend, uh, obviously SEC Network Plus is where you can find most SEC games. And you're going to need some great internet. You're going to need maybe a uh, special media room to watch the games. Or maybe you just want to mount your TV in the living room and have some of that special surround sound. Any of those things, if it sounds like that's something you want to do, our friends at Integrated Media can help you with that. Call them here locally, 803-948-8327, integratedmediainc.com. And also, uh, from what I'm seeing in here, 
We got some fancy looking new cameras. There's a new monitor over here. Yep. And um, y'all are going to see our mugs on the internet here soon. Uh, I, I guess you all want to. I don't really yeah. know if you do or not. But now, They haven't put one in here for me yet, so maybe they'll yeah, be so lucky. Where is your fancy Ma- maybe they'll be camera? Luck- maybe they'll be lucky to not see me. No, we got to get you one back there too, man. Um, yeah, these cameras look... Oh, they're high tech. They look expensive. nice. Expensive. I don't know where that one's facing. Off. Uh, we need. We need a. Um, so that would be the Chris Cam, I think. The Chris Clark Cam. Yeah. We need one facing out into the uh, the sidewalk out there too, like a, uh, you know, people walking by. Yeah. Oh, we get some crowd inter- cam. We get some interesting folks to walk by these windows. Oh, uh, let me tell you do. about it. So yeah, shout out Integrated Media. Even if you don't need a bunch of family or a bunch of fancy cameras in your media room at the house like we have here, they can help you with whatever your needs are. So as we wrap up, I don't know, I think you, uh, Kendall said you were listening at the end of the In the Bonus, in the 9 o'clock hour. She's getting ready to take grad photos and can't decide on what jersey she wants to buy. She said all of her friends are going to have like the generic number one uniform, but she wants to buy an actual like player jersey, you know, mm-hmm. support them through NIL and all that stuff, and uh, such a tough life, right? That Kendall lives, right? Can't, she's d- she's narrowed it down to uh, DQ Smith because her last name is Smith, uh, Nick Eman Worry, who she personally knows, you know, from back when he was in high school, um, and really no other third option. I threw out there Kai Kroger because I thought that'd just be unique and cool. Um, mm-hmm. Anything you can think of? Well, I'm, I mean, of course, Kendall has to disagree with me. I'm the one who told her to go with the black jerseys because they're yes. kind of throwbacks. Yeah. I think those are the best of Carolina's jerseys. I think they're the best looking, um, certainly on the field. I, I don't know. I don't know if I see as many people wearing those for, you know, glamour photos or whatever they're they're doing for that. But I told her to get 23 because it's her grad year. That's, that's a good point. <clears throat> and 23 normally is a pretty good, you know, Jordan. Sure. 23 is a good number. It's a Ab- great number. Absolutely. So I, I said 23 for that. Um, I think she turns 23 this year, too, so it works as far uh, as that. Yeah, I think that sounds right. As far as that goes. So that's what I said, black jersey 23. Now, are you a jersey guy? Do you have a collection yourself? Heck no. No? I do not own a single jersey. Not a single one? No. Wow. Don't roll like that. I'm, I'm firmly in the... I, I feel like... Here's my philosophy. I, I feel like females can get away with wearing the jersey like it's a good look for yeah. them. Yeah. I'm I'm not the guy wearing there's, the jersey. There's definitely a cutoff point for guys as mm. far as when I think it's socially acceptable to continue wearing a jersey. Like when you're a kid and, you know, even in high school, like all day long, no problem. But as you get into your adult years, there's definitely an age, and I don't want to put a specific number on it, where wearing a jersey out in public is not looked upon as favorably. I feel like if you wear the jersey a little bit ironically, like you're just going to the game to sit on the front row and pound beers sure. all game. Sure. You know, maybe but like, but only, like gro- only so many people can pull off the jersey look. But like grocery store, that's a little different. Yeah, you're not wearing the jersey to work yeah. on Monday. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not a big jersey guy. When I was a kid, I loved... My first jersey was a Kerry Collins 12 okay. jersey for the Panthers after they drafted him. I guess that probably would have been with the first pick. Yeah. Um, huge Panthers fan as a kid. And I, I used to have the T-shirts that were like T-shirt jerseys. made like jerseys. Yep. But that was when I was a kid. I think my first jersey was <laughs> Michael Vick Atlanta Falcons jersey back, in, uh, back when that uh, whole pandemonium was going on. Yeah, I see, I see Jay outside uh, complaining to Terry that we're still talking. Yeah, we'll wrap getting it up. The, uh, getting yeah. the signal here. We're just still fun. a second. We're having fun talking about jerseys. All right, we're going <laughs> to hand this off. Yeah, halftime show with Jay and Terry coming up next. Me and Wes will be back tomorrow for the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Presented by Firehouse Subs, 107.5 The Game.